Hi everyone, Stepan here. Today I'm going to finish the series on the Slav defense with a very annoying variation why it could go for called the Modern Slav. Now, it's not really clear what the Modern Slav is. Most people refer to this move Queen B3 as the Modern Slav, but you could also enter the Modern Slav via a different move order, G3 and get to the same situation with queen b3 after something like bishop f5, knight c3, e6, queen b3, which is uh, the same position by transposition. But after knight f6, queen b3, this is what most people call the modern Slav, and it's characterized by a kingside fianchetto for white and the queen on b3. Uh, why is this annoying? Well, uh, first of all, Semi-Slav players are unable to play what they usually play. In this position you can't just go e6 normally because you you have no compensation for your bishop on c8 and you basically have a worse position. So you need to be able to react to this. So most novice players in Slav and Semi-Slav positions are going to be confused here. Now just before I start with the theory, I played against this once. It was in the middle of a tournament so I had time to prepare. And I learned the theory pretty well. I knew everything what I was supposed to do in the first 10 moves. And in the middle game, he outplayed me so easily. Because this is the only thing he plays. And he's been playing it for years. And he just knew so many middle game plans. And I didn't have any experience uh, with playing my semi-slav or slav. Uh, against uh, a fianchetto position with a queen on b3. So this requires a lot of experience and opening theory knowledge will not be uh, enough, which is why I would recommend this as a secret weapon for players with white. I have, well, I am going to be using the modern Slav. I think it's quite annoying and not too many people know about it. It's sort of a hidden gem, which is out in the open. Anybody can use it, but not many people do. Okay, uh, against queen b3, uh, there is only one main move, and that's d takes c4. e6 is playable, it's a sideline, and we are also going to be looking at two quite rare uh, lines with g6 and queen b6. Uh, one of them can end up in a pretty interesting variation, so let's look at those two first. g6, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it enters a sort of schlechter slav. Uh, pawn structure with the white queen on b3, so after g6, knight c3, bishop g7, cd, cd, bishop g5, e6, e3, castles. You have the variation of the Schlechter uh, in which you are forced to play b6 uh, at some point because your bishop is on f5 or on g4. Here your bishop is still hemmed in on c8. And as I mentioned in the Schlechter video, uh, after g6, the early queen b3 by white is a very annoying sideline, which, as you can see, transposes to this position. So if you want more variation on this, you can watch the video on the, on the Schlechter Slav. As I said, g6 here I wouldn't recommend because queen b3 I think is annoying as a response to the Schlechter. So after queen b3, why would you play the Schlechter? In my opinion, that that doesn't make too much sense. The other line I want to mention as something tricky, but not good, uh, in my opinion, is queen b6. Uh, because now white can go for the London system or some other openings. Uh, this setup where whoever plays their queen to the b file first uh, is able to then advance their c pawn to force a trade. So in this position, white is able to play this tricky move c5, Queen takes b3, a takes b3, and now bishop f5, which is the main move, knight c3. Uh, black needs to play the move knight a6, otherwise he's faced with b4, b5, a minority attack, which can be extremely annoying. And when he plays knight a6, the only way to justify this play after, uh, well, okay, this is very tricky. The main move here is e4. Uh, and e4 tries to exploit the positioning of the black pieces, even though it loses a pawn temporarily. e4, uh, if... I have to turn on the engine. If black decides to take it... Well, let's see what would happen. The knight is going to hang, so takes, takes, and rook takes here after you capture the bishop. No, let's just take, just take here. Takes, takes. Uh, the knight is going to move, and now your c6 pawn is in trouble, your a6 pawn is in trouble, and e4 basically threatens to capture that annoying knight. So after e4, 
black doesn't have time to take on uh, to take on e4 black has to do something aggressive so in this position after e4 black plays the move knight before after knight before uh, you are now faced with a knight c2 check so you need to do something uh, you play rook a4 to save your rook and you allow knight c2 and after knight c2 king d2 you might be wondering well did they just lose my knight well you did but you're going to get enough compensation knight takes e4 first of all winning a pawn knight takes bishop takes bishop d3 uh, trying to exchange some attacking pieces and take the knight on c2 bishop takes f3 g takes f3 knight takes d4 rook takes d4 e5 and in this position as you can see uh, black is a whole bishop down but he has two pawns for that and he has induced uh, several structural weaknesses to white's position so he has more than enough compensation for the piece doubled b pawns doubled isolated f pawns and an isolated h2 pawn mean that uh, White has almost no useful pawns on the board. The only useful break could be b4, b5, but that's far-fetched. And this huge center and the fact that the rook has to move again give black enough time to develop. So let's just go over that one more time slowly. So after queen b3, uh, in the modern, you can go for queen b6 if you know what you're doing. So c5 is going to be played by most people because this is a very common pattern. Queen takes b3, a takes b3, bishop f5, develop your bishop first, knight c3, uh, and well, if if white tries to push his pawn uh, now, then you can take the b1 knight and be slightly better. So knight c3, knight a6, and now e4, using the knight, uh, using the fact that the pawn cannot be taken, using the fact that white can capture on a6 and win c6 or a6. Knight b4, threatening knight c2 check. Rook a4, stopping, uh, well, not stopping knight c2 check, but not losing the rook. Knight c2 check anyway. King to d2. Of course, if the knight retreats back to a6, then white is going to take it and win. So now after knight c2, we get this tricky variation. Knight e4, knight e4. Knight, uh, bishop e4. Bishop d3, bishop f3, ruining the pawn structure. And now knight takes d4, giving up a knight and e5. To be honest, I would rather be black here. Uh, so this may be a new, very interesting weapon I'm going to use when I meet uh, the modern Slav next. But of course, it's tricky, and you are a piece down, and experienced player is going to punish this. The engines hate black, but I don't really mind playing this position. Uh, I don't think it's easy for, for white to win, especially in blitz chess or rapid chess. This could be a very viable way to play. Okay, uh, well, and uh, I said queen b6 is not good, but it can be played. Okay, now let's look at this sideline with e6. Uh, e6 is not such a good variation because you are closing down the pawn triangle without uh, opening your bishop up to f5. The main move is uh, in the main line, uh, the bishop either goes to f5 or g4. Now white continues with either g3 uh, in the normal modern fashion or he plays bishop g5, both are playable. G3, uh, bishop e7, bishop g2, castles, castles, knight bd7, knight c3 is a normal setup, but you have this bad bishop. So what you are going to have to do is you're going to have to play the move b6, and after white captures on d5, you have to take with the e-pawn, you now have to fight to play the move c5 and to open the position up, which either means you're going to be left with, a, with an isolated queen's pawn, or that you're going to be sacrificing a pawn. Now, what white wants to do is help you open your bishop up with the move e4 because that blows the position open. So most often, if white knows what he is doing, you're going to be facing the move e4. Rook a d1, rook e8, e4. And now, of course, you have to take knight e4, knight e4, d4, knight e5. Uh, you can now play the move c5 way more easily uh, because you are not left with the isolated d pawn. But you need to be careful because there's a lot of tension on this diagonal and for the moment white is threatening to take the e4 pawn. If you turn on the engine, uh, well, okay, I just wanted to examine this, uh, uh, this idea of playing f5, so moving the king and uh, stopping the spin and playing f5, but you simply don't have time for that because in the meantime uh, white can just capture. So let's say we take here pawn takes attacking the queen uh, the queen defends the bishop and bishop takes as you can see 
you don't have time to, to be defending that pawn. The other move after e6 is bishop g5, simply pinning your knight, knight bd7, knight c3 again. White goes for a very, very normal developing plan, and black is stuck with that c8 bishop, trying to play the normal semi-slav. White got in the move bishop g5 and has no problems. So I, even though e6 is playable, it's slightly less risky than going for the main line, I wouldn't recommend it. White simply has no problems. Bishop d3, dc4, queen c4, knight d5, takes, takes, castles. I would just prefer to be white here because I don't have to, uh, I don't have to suffer with my bishop. In this line, one of the main ideas is to actually give up uh, the c6 pawn. Okay, white doesn't have to play this tricky move, knight e5. This is considered to be the best to just stop e5 because white, uh, white was faced with e5 now enough defenders so 95 uh, 90, 95 stops that but after takes takes white now has doubled pawns and black's main idea is b6 giving up the pawn and playing bishop b7 so now we can see how big the issue of the bishop is which is why i don't like the move bishop uh, the move e6 closing the position down so instead of that after queen b3 i would recommend only one move uh, if you are playing a serious tournament game and that's the move d takes c4 uh, because this now allows you enough time to open your bishop up to either f5 or g4 queen takes c4 and now you get to choose of course you want to do that to get the queen away from b7 to make sure you have enough time to develop your bishop bishop g4 is a sideline which i wouldn't recommend bishop f5 is better uh, and more commonly played of 1500 games from this position bishop f5 g3 as i said this queen b3 and g3 is what makes the modern slav the modern slav only now you play e6 closing down the structure bishop g2 knight b to d7 castles bishop e7 and here white can either play e3 or knight c3 there are several other moves, but these two are most common. Uh, whichever move uh, white plays, you castle next. And let's say knight c3, castles. Uh, you can see that this position is fairly pleasant for black. You don't have a bad bishop on c8. The diagonal for the g2 bishop is kind of blocked for now. The problem is that you are most probably going to be facing the move e4, which is going to either gain space or open the center up with the later d5. If white plays the move e3, you castle again, uh, rook to d1. White is bringing all of his pieces to the center, playing against, sort of like playing against the Scandinavian setup where you are trying to force through d5. Uh, queen c7. Knight c3, knight d5. What you want to do is control d5 as much as possible. Sort of, so you want to provoke him into taking. Of course, if white ever takes, then black is just better in the skulls, but because the minority attack is far away from happening, the queen has to move. e4 is not happening. You have a very good bishop pair. Black has a bad bishop on c on c1, which in the skulls but belongs on g5 and traded off on e7, or pinning the knight on g5. So after knight d5, one of the most common maneuvers for white is knight e1, opening up this bishop on the diagonal, knight takes c3, b takes c3, and now e5 by black. Black needs to play energetically, this pawn center is extremely strong, and you need to be able to break it open. Uh, in the other line, with knight c3, again, you have to be looking for plans for black, because this is all mainline theory, and when I, when I play that game against the player who plays the modern slav all the time we had this position on the board and he just had way more experience he played rook to d1 he played knight c3 uh his bishop uh can't really remember what he, where his c1 bishop went but okay knight c3 uh castles rook to e1 knight to e4 is another plan black could go for trying to trade the pieces off now queen b3 attacking b7, queen b6 defending, knight h4 harassing the bishop. And in this position, uh, black, which is sort of counterintuitive in the Slav or semi-Slav pawn structures like this one, gave up his dark squared bishop to induce structural advantages. So this is a theoretical variation in which bishop takes h4 is played, g takes h4 and knight d to f6, where black has given up his bishop pair for activity on the king side. So even plans like this are possible. My point is, in this position after bishop e7, what you need to do is try to use the fact that your bishop is open, 
Uh, try to anticipate the move e4. Try to play e5 if you can, because that will bring you a lot more central space. The next thing you want to do is castle and bring your rook to the rooks to the center, either c8, d8, or d8, uh, e8. And you need to prevent white from being active. As I said, e4 is going to be one of his main ideas. Knight e1 as well, trying to wreak havoc on this diagonal. Be careful about your b7 pawn, be careful about your c6 pawn. In fact, be careful, because it's a tricky position. Uh, from here, uh, white has a sort of okay score, 29% uh, with knight c3, 37% with e3, even though knight c3 is the more common move. So the modern Slav is a tricky move, which you could face. Remember that the best move after queen to b3 is taking on c4 and after queen takes c4 so that you can develop your bishop to f5 without losing the b7 pawn, so bishop f5. g3, you now close the position down with e6. You have completed your Slav Karokan structure with the bishop outside. Bishop g2, knight bd7, white castles, you play bishop e7. And white can now go for either knight c3 or e3. Let's go for e3, which is the best move. You castle. Rook d1, queen e2 can also be played. Queen c7, connecting your rooks, developing your queen, reinforcing b7, reinforcing c6, reinforcing e5, which is the most important reason for that. This is a Sicilian idea, and it comes in many openings where e5 is a good move. Knight c3. After knight c3 comes, you want to fight for d5, you want to fight for e4, so you play knight d5, challenging this knight. Uh, the immediate uh, e4 would, of course, be met with knight takes and bishop takes e4. And now knight e1, trying to exert pressure on this diagonal. And this is what white is going to be going for. What he wants to do is play e4, therefore he moves his knight, he opens up his bishop, and the positions are going to get quite tricky and quite aggressive. And as opposed to the Schlechter, which we saw in the last video, the modern Slav is, requires you to be very precise. So I would advise you to look at some games by, by very strong players. From this position, you can look at uh, Mamedyarov Karyakin, 2011, uh, Matlakov Yakovenko, 2011. Very interesting games. Both games won by white, but I prefer to look at games where white won, uh, if I'm going to be playing this with black more often, so that I can learn the traps and what to avoid. Okay, with this video we are finishing the series on the Slav. Uh, I'm going to be continuing with the Benoni defense, uh, which starts tomorrow. Uh, let me know what you think about the Slav. Uh, let me know if there's any advice about the Benoni you would like me to know before I start. Uh, and the first video is up tomorrow. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, see you soon. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.